We have the sky falling in many asset classes, from stocks to China to crypto, and we need to discuss that fear. We also have some big catalysts and reports coming this week, both good and bad, and we have to prepare for those as well. And the only thing that I ask in return for all of this is that you hit that ravishing like button, and also don't forget to subscribe either. Also, quick plug, Zip Trader use prices will be going up this week, so if you do want to lock in lifetime access at the current price point, make sure to check out the link below. Right now, we are in this environment where fear has been steadily increasing for weeks. The UV VXY fear index is on an overall uptrend. The SPY is on an overall downtrend. Risk appetite is decreasing fast. ARC has continued to plummet. Pretty much every growth stock is heading into a consistent downtrend, getting more and more oversold, whereas a lot of the bigger major cap stocks are also starting to see sell-offs. In terms of reasons, well, we have about three weeks left of tax loss harvesting for folks trying to harvest some losses for 2021. We have, of course, the variant spooking people. Tapering has, of course, begun, and people are anticipating future sell-offs because of interest rate hikes. People right now that are just looking at all the variables, and they're saying, okay, well, hey, fund manager, pull out all my money from the market because there's a lot of uncertainty right now. I want to lock in these capital gains rates. I'm worried about all of the negative catalysts. Let's just go ahead and take the profits off the table and then rebuy back in when things become more stable, whatever that means. Of course, on the flip side, we could see that 2019 post-tapering fear rally that we had after the huge sell-off towards the end of 2018. But this time around, of course, there are a lot more points of uncertainty and no two time periods within the stock market are alike, at least not completely alike. We're in a market that has a lot of margin in it. And quite frankly, when there's a lot of margin in a market, it doesn't really matter if the catalysts have legs or not. What matters is if people are selling the catalysts because that's all it takes for people who are heavily leveraged to get what margin called. You may not think the variant's a big issue. It may never end up being a huge issue. But if enough people sell on it, well, it becomes an issue. That's the same thing to whatever FUD catalyst you're seeing right now. Whether they pan out or not, whether inflation is out of control, whether interest rates do spike a lot faster than anticipated, well, if enough people think they will, well, all of a sudden you got massive, massive destabilizing pressure. Futures right now are looking fairly strong, but I'd be lying if I said that you couldn't see more downside because of all these catalysts. I don't want to sound like I'm pushing FUD or favor, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of people are used to dips that recover immediately. Sometimes you get dips that don't recover immediately, but those are the ones that you actually want because they have a lot more broad profit potential. A big dip is very, very good for us as traders and very, very good for the market to take a damn breath. But when you're looking at the overall trend, we're in a downtrend right now. So when it comes down to it, you have to make sure that you're being very, very strategic on what you buy the dip on and what your outlook and time horizon is. Sometimes having a time horizon of well, this needs to go up by lunchtime just doesn't work because the market's not rewarding it like that. When it comes down to catalyst plays, you may find stocks that run up by lunchtime, but a lot of times you won't find that in the conviction markets. You won't find that on anything that has to do with fundamentals. But anyways, moving on to the crypto market, Bitcoin broke into the mid 40s for the first time in months, which has led to the El Salvador president tweeting that they are buying the dip. He said, El Salvador just bought the dip 150 coins at an average USD price of 48,000. And he added, missed the effing bottom by seven minutes someone asked do you think he just trades for the country on his laptop and he responded no the phone this is the literal verified twitter of the president of el salvador he actually calls himself in his twitter bio the ceo of el salvador so correction there and at the end of the day the more people and especially countries that buy bitcoin at dips the more resiliency it has in both a reputation standpoint from both a reputation standpoint and as an actual price and demand standpoint bitcoin and the overall cryptocurrency market need to 100 percent absolutely have periods of extreme sell-offs to prove to people who are looking at this and analyzing it that, hey, wait a second, this has resiliency, this isn't going anywhere, this is on an overall uptrend. If you get into the situation where it just goes up dramatically over and over and over again and never takes a breath, well, the breath that it's going to take is going to be very, 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 very rough. It's going to knock a lot of people out and people aren't going to want to rebuy the dip. But overall, the crypto sector as a whole lost tons of capital over the weekend and last week. And a lot of that can be linked to the SEC's recent rhetoric. Crypto exchanges thought they could throw a fastball, according to a former SEC chairman, but they warned that enforcement is coming. Current chairman Gensler said platforms, whether they're trading platforms, lending platforms, whether they call themselves centralized or they call themselves decentralized, are an important place for public policy and investor protection. He added, and this is the threatening part, he added that when the SEC and trading platforms cannot come to an understanding, we're going to use the enforcement tool. 
of suing entities that fail to register with the agency. But I think that a better approach for these platforms is to work to get them registered within the law. Of course, many crypto companies would argue that they don't have much clarity in terms of what needs to be and what shouldn't be registered. There's not much concrete regulation or guidelines in the crypto space right now. It's a very, very big gray area, and a lot of crypto companies that are trying to play by the rules aren't really sure what the rules are. And the SEC has been very, very slow at providing any sort of clear guidelines or clarity as to what fits their criteria and what is going to lead them to getting, well, the hammer if they do something wrong. And obviously, a lot of players in the crypto game are complete scumbags, but there's also a lot of good players in the crypto game that are trying to, trying to build honest relationships and real transactional value with their clients. And unfortunately, when you have very, very bold and big statements like this that are threatening and don't have a lot of clarity, well, it screws the entire industry, both the good and the bad. Regulation could certainly help build trust in an industry, but overregulation and unclear guidelines can definitely stifle growth. When you look at a lot of the random actions that the SEC has taken, it's creating this picture of very, very strong uncertainty for the entire industry. And you're seeing that ripple through everywhere when it comes down to exchanges, when it comes down to the actual tokens and coins, when it comes down to even miners. I don't need to bring up Mara, lovely Mara. But at the end of the day, I don't think that the SEC is trying to screw the industry. I think that it's more so they're just struggling to figure out how to regulate it. And in the future, we're going to get more clarity and then a lot of that FUD will wipe away. But right now, it's looking a little bit murky because of this step up in rhetoric. Of course, though, when it rains, it pours and we have some more fear in China. CNN recently reported that Didi's delisting could spell the end of Chinese stocks on Wall Street. It goes on shortly after its $4.4 billion initial public offering in the U.S. in late June. Chinese regulators banned Didi from app stores in China, saying it broke data privacy laws and posed cybersecurity risks. The decision to target Didi was widely seen as punishment for its decision to go public overseas, and the company became a prime example of China's efforts to curb the power of big tech firms. And here's an important part. Chinese founders previously looked to New York, aka listing in the U.S., for a number of reasons, including looser listing standards, often higher multiples, and a domicile beyond Beijing's financial and regulatory grasp. That calculus has rapidly changed, and today's companies, especially established market leaders or those in certain tech sectors, will face increasing pressure to list on China-controlled exchanges, as opposed to, say, U.S. exchanges. Now, where it gets freaky and you have a little bit of overlap of regulatory FUD is on Thursday, the SEC finalized rules that would allow it to delist foreign firms that refuse to open their books, whereas China, at the same time as this legislation, already rejects the U.S. from what? Well, auditing their open books, which means that you have a clashing of two authorities here. Now, it's worth noting that U.S. listed Chinese stocks are still subject to big four accounting audits. It's just that the details from those audits aren't all set to U.S. regulators open book style. But anyways, this is the latest escalation in a trend of uncertainty for Chinese stocks that we've seen all year. If you look at the BKTCN index, which tracks Chinese stocks listed in the US, we are trading at lows that we haven't hit since the COVID drop. And then before that, during the interest rate scares in late 2018, regardless of the underlying stock, whether it was a company that made tons and tons of money and dramatically increased its market share or didn't, it's more likely than not plummeted this year. People are selling out in anticipation of more regulatory fear and blowback. And obviously China has always been a place of regulatory uncertainty and rolling fear and rolling euphoria. We've seen this so many different times on so many different levels, but each time you never really know if this is going to be the time where China decides to put down the hammer or the sickle. So what are the chances that China decides to say delist something like a Neo, an XPEV, a BABA? And what happens if they do? Well, first of all, obviously one can't really predict what they're going to do next. But if one is going to analyze their trajectory, their first and foremost requirement is to target big data and big tech companies. So we have not seen them try to curtail electric vehicle manufacturing. There has been some rhetoric on some of the more sketchy companies, but we haven't seen much negativity in terms of Neo, XPEV, and Li, other than the general association. The Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission was asked about the structure that Neo, XPEV, and Li hold, the VIE structure, and they said that they are not considering barring that structure. You could speculate all you want on that, but I'd argue the bigger threat for something like a Neo and XPEV or a Li is really our regulatory authorities, the SEC, coming in and getting them. Because if China has the rule of not not letting them be completely audited by U.S. authorities, well, it's possible that they'd be delisted based on not fitting our criteria. But in that case, if you actually read what the SEC's new guidelines say, well, it says they actually have quite a bit of leeway. They have three years to comply to the standards or be delisted. 
And of course, I'm sure the SEC would be willing to work with them after that as well, because we've seen that happen with other companies that didn't comply with other regulations. But in terms of Baba specifically, I'd argue the ball is really in China's court. The company itself is excellent, it has legs everywhere, the business model is insane, but the problem is the CCP doesn't like it, it doesn't want it to flourish, so it's not flourishing. You know, people ask me all the time, do you like Alibaba? I'm like, yeah, I like Alibaba a lot, but if the Chinese Communist Party doesn't want it to work, it's not gonna work. Do I think this is an insane deal and it's probably oversold? Yes, but you can't say for certain just because, again, you have that regulatory risk. I think that there's more regulatory risk still remaining with Baba than there are with the EV companies because China wants the EV companies to see tons and tons of capital flow into them so that they can be the leader in EVs, whereas China wants to curtail the power of big tech firms like Alibaba. But in terms of delisting, of course, the fear of delisting is going to tank stocks even if they don't get delisted. There's been so many times where delisting threats have really, really freaked out Chinese stock valuations and they've just gone on to rebound afterwards, but there's also that threat that, hey, maybe this time's different. So I would say, make sure that you're playing the game with risk controlled bets instead of saying, oh, I know that it's not going to get delisted or, oh, I know that it's going to get delisted. Because truth be told, nobody really knows. In terms of what happens during delisting, sometimes the stock goes on to trade on the OTC market. Sometimes US investors get exchange shares of equal to similar value from say the Hong Kong market, or in some cases your shares get bought back by said company. Okay, earnings. So slow start to the week. On Monday, we got software as a service company, Coupa reporting. On Tuesday, we have AutoZone reporting. Don't really care about that. But most notably, we have ChargePoint, the point of charging. Right now, we aren't really in a conviction market that rewards fundamentals, especially for some up and coming companies. But that's the best time for you to say, hey, I'm going to look at their earnings report. I'm going to see if they're fulfilling my expectations on a company wide level. And then I'm going to build conviction, whether up or down. If a company's doing really, really well during bad conditions in the market, that's like, hey, well, now I have more conviction as a dip buy. With ChargePoint, we want to see hardware sales increasing and, of course, subscription sales increasing as well because the more hardware they sell, the more people need to pay for subscriptions in order to have the software on said hardware. You also have Rene Solar representing the solar sector this week. On Wednesday, we have UiPath, which is a very early stage arc automation play for increasing productivity in the workplace. I do like this company a lot. I'm a little bit worried about it when it comes down to interest rate spikes and inflationary concerns but hey long term i like uipath a lot i think this is going to be something we talked about for years you have gamestop now gamestop of course is one of the leaders of the meme movement could gme's earnings spike interest in the overall meme stocks that have been beaten down a lot over the last couple of weeks and saw short sellers increase shorting pressure well certainly we've seen that in the past keeping an eye on that on thursday we have lulu oracle broadcom and more importantly chewy chewy as a pet supply delivery company is kind of in the sweet spot between a regular tech company e-commerce company and a stay-at-home pump company. It'll be very, very interesting to see how Chewy reacts to earnings and what the earnings actually are, of course. These days, though, it seems like people don't even read their earnings. They're just like, is it bad? Sell. Is it good? Sell. And then lastly, on Friday, we have the next big inflation report being released, the infamous CPI index. Last month's CPI index was the last straw before the Fed conversation really changed from inflation being transitory to it needing a tone shift. Very, very strong focus on the top line. Overall, average pricing pressures. We can't have many more 0.9s overall in a month before the market really starts freaking out. On the bright side, with oil and most energy prices cooling off some in November, it's certainly possible that that has resulted in some slowing down from the energy segment, which likely would start reducing transportation costs in many of the other segments and help apply downward pressure. But at the same time, burdens with variant supply chain and overall new regulations on an international level could screw some other sectors. Anyways, that caps off the video. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us below or join us on Zip Trader Circle. Of course, we do have our Black Friday 100 coupon code, which is still active on Zip Trader U. If you'd like to sign up for lifetime access to our step-by-step -step lessons, our private chat, our daily morning briefings, and of course, our price targets, I'll put the link below. If you're wondering what broker to trade these stocks on, well, Webull is also linked below. And if you sign up and deposit, you'll get two free stocks valued up to quite a lot. So make sure to check them out if you haven't already. Have a good one, and I'll see you in the next video.